first, yeah, uh, just a few words about the book, because this was a wider project, and uh, which has just come to completion. The book is going to be published in a month's time by Oxford University Press. And I must say it has been a fantastic experience, this book, because uh, the group uh, uh, with whom uh, I worked, um, I, you know, with the purpose of producing this book was, was just a, a great group. And uh, we will have a sample of... Uh, we could say the chapters because we have three contributors here in addition to myself that are going to, to speak about their theme. Um, so in, the book is in fact uh, centered around three main themes. One is marriage because there are five papers that uh, really concern marriage. And uh, you know, there are two styles of paper in the book. There are kind of review papers and uh, for marriage, uh, there is a review paper uh, on intra-household bargaining in poor countries by uh, Jean-Marie Ballon and Roberta Zip uh, Ziparo. And then they are more focused uh, paper on different aspects. You will see that uh, uh, with Sarah Law, who will uh, talk on behalf of uh, her work with Nathan Nunn. Uh, and they are work uh, by Dominique van der Waal in uh, this respect too, who worked with Sylvie Lambert and uh, Paola Villar. And uh, there is also a paper by Rebecca Tonton and one by Selim Guleski. The second theme is outside option. You know, the impact of outside option on the status of women and um, about, uh, you know, the impact on early uh, pregnancy, gender gaps. And here we have a series of papers by Marcus Goldstein, uh, by uh, Shetil Bjarvatten and co-author Ricardo Osman, uh, Jim Ferron, Xavier Hine, and co authors, etc. And the third theme is laws and cultural norms, uh, which uh, has six chapters. Um, and the paper I'm going to present is, in a sense, of a review article on that topic. Uh, and we have a paper by Shivan Anderson and Dibra uh, another one by Bijurao, one by Nancy Kian, one by John Bowen, and uh, uh, finally, a fascinating paper on the case of abortion in El Salvador with what's presently happening with the state intervention by a team of uh, uh, Latin American people and Jocelyn Viterna. Uh, so there are some sociologists in the team, but I must say it's still dominated by economists. There is no doubt about that. Uh, so no, so much for the book. So now I turn uh, to my, my own presentation. And so I'm going to report about uh, um, a chapter that has been written by uh, uh, Julia Camillotti, who has been my PhD student in Amur, uh, and Emmanuel Oriol, uh, and myself. Okay, so what is uh, that we are trying to do here? We are reviewing the literature on what we call social engineering, which means the attempt to change oppressive social norms. Uh, and uh, in doing that, we proposed a theoretical, not a, a single theoretical framework, but we try to think with a link to theory to put some order in the empirical literature, which is not huge, by the way. Uh, and so uh, the idea is essentially no, you have seen since quite a time uh, a number of international conventions, starting with the convention to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women by the United Nations in 79, followed by another one called the UN Fact Sheet on Harmful Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children, 95, which listed a number of oppressive social norms and practices, uh, including female genital cutting, early marriage, a son preference, female infanticide, and others. And so we want to assess that to say, is it really useful? Should we expect an impact for this kind of approach that through a new law, and in this case, an international law, try to influence uh, practices? And if yes, what are the underlying uh, assumptions? Uh, and then we try to think, and uh, you will see that uh, there is a clear orientation in the, in the paper uh, regarding this. Uh, we are trying to look at other methods to try to change social norms and practices. One is changing preference, and the second one is, um, <coughs> is in fact, a change in the macro-technical environment that can be sometimes deliberately influenced by uh, state authorities. Now, coming first, I, I, I come to the law. Now, the law, I think it's very important from the very start to distinguish between two effects of the law. The e expressive effect of the law or the deterrent effect of the law. And first, I'll focus on the expressive effect. The expressive effect, in fact, is assuming that the law can act as a focal point in a coordination game. And in a sense that you are in a game where there are multiple equilibria. 
uh, Nash equilibria, in fact, in pure strategies. And the law is supposed to change the focal point by driving attention to another way of uh, changing or, or behaving in this case. Okay, and so uh, uh, just look at uh, the present game just to make things clear. So you have a, a game of female genital mutilation where the choice is between of, of two uh, parental couples, you cut or circumcise your daughter or you don't do it. Okay, and there is another couple. This can be generalized to one person, there is no problem. So I assume that mu is denoting the benefit of coordination. And minus theta v, which is what you get when you cut your daughter and the other one does not. Uh, so this is the, yes, the, the first row, the second column. Uh, is, in fact, you can conceive, is the cost of following the practice. Theta can be conceived of as the health risk, for instance, that you incur by uh, circumcising your daughter. Uh, and V is an amplifying factor. And in fact, what we have in mind here is that the amplifying factor can be influenced by policy. I'll come back uh, to that. No, uh, obviously, as you all know, uh, here the problem is that you have two Nash equilibria, uh, both reject the practice or both cut their daughters, and uh, you have a problem of equilibrium selection. The focal point just say that at one point uh, you have a custom and the custom is a focal point, but if you had a law that emphasized, uh, uh, let's say, the benefit or the need to uh, uh, stop a cutting practice, the attention could be shifted to this uh, new law and, and the practice could stop. This suppose, of course, that you have homogeneous preference, the first thing, and that people don't like the practice. They would just like to change it. The problem is the expectation against, uh, about what the other are doing are pessimistic, and so they still do something that they don't like to do. So you have a law, it could change, it could change the practice. Now, uh, if you know, uh, try to elaborate a little bit on this concept of equilibrium selection, and you say, yeah, but maybe there is not only the focal point, but just think about a risk dominant strategy, you know, uh, in the way Arsani and uh, Zeltan have seen it. Uh, and, uh, you know, these people have an uncertainty about what the other will do, and they try to avoid risk, which means that they don't look only at the benefit that they have if they both cooperate in rejecting the practice, but they look also at the deviation they got if the other doesn't do it, huh? then, you know, it has been shown uh, to an evolutionary argument that uh, if the number of uh, repeated periods is large enough, uh, people will select a risk-dominant strategy, and the whole question is, does it coincide or not? with the Pareto efficient equilibrium. Uh, in the famous and celebrated stack hunt <coughs> game, it does not, but it happened that in a game of that kind, it does. So in a sense, what you would, uh, if you believe in this risk dominant strategy equilibrium selection process, you would expect that the practice should disappear. People should reject the practice because this is the risk dominant strategy and it happens to coincide with uh, the Pareto efficient uh, equilibrium outcome. No, what I want to draw our attention to is what about the literature, the empirical literature, what does it tell us? And in fact, uh, this is an important question because many international organizations, including the UN and NGO, have been driven by this approach and in fact have sometimes explicitly referred to it. And in fact, we have a few studies, uh, I won't show it on the slide because I don't have time, but there is a paper first by Belma and co-author in Journal of Development Economics where they find that for West Africa, almost 90% of the variation in support, uh, and yes, support, let's say, for female genital mutilation uh, is explained by individual and household characteristics, which is not what you expect in a game of coordination, where you would expect that what matters is what the other do. And in fact, they find no, and that in the communities where the practice of female genital mutilation is more prevailing, then the importance of individual and household characteristics is more important. So this is troubling for this thesis. Then there is a paper on Sudan by Efferson and uh, the author, who just have this uh, very simple argument. They say, if you believe in this kind of, uh, of game, then you should expect to have villages where the practice exists and others where it does not exist. Or at least you should find a discontinuity in the distribution of the practice across villages. 
And what he finds is that there, there are absolutely no sign of discontinuity. The, the, the distribution is uh, completely smooth. Then you could say, yeah, but maybe, you know, this is an argument, the main argument behind this, why do you cut your daughter, is the marriage market. I want to enhance the value of my, my daughter for the marriage market. And so maybe the village community doesn't coincide with the marriage pool, but they find that uh, most of the marriage take place within the village community, so that does not apply. They bring also a number of other evidence with uh, uh, a number of uh, implicit asso uh, association tests, which shows that even the attitude towards the practice does not significantly vary among those who cut their daughter and those who do not. And this is subject to uh, different kind of interpretation. But I want to uh, maybe give an uh, emphasis to a study done by Julia Camillotti, uh, my PhD student that he did in southern Senegal, because I think that uh, uh, she's bringing interesting uh, aspect into, into light. What did she do? She studied the impact of an intervention of an NGO called Tostan in Senegal. Uh, for this intervention, by the way, Tostan got the prize of the best NGO, uh, the Hillary Clinton Prize of the best NGO in the world for the year, some five or six years a year, two articles from page of New York Times for the work they did in Senegal. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to look more carefully into that. It was difficult to convince them because they say, we know that we have been successful. In fact, all funders come to us to, to support other action of us. But still, we succeeded in, uh, in doing it. And what did we find? You know, first, I want to say one thing, is that something interesting in Tostan is that the, the process of changing the norm is based on first invoking and referring explicitly to the law. And there has been a new law enacted by the Senegalese government, uh, parliament, according to which the practice is banned, and there are uh, even punishment, if, you know, fees to pay, fines to pay, uh, even prison, uh, you know. So it's, it's going a little bit about the expressive thing, but uh, there is a law. And they just invoked the law and the international convention explained that to the women and even the health risk uh, to that extent. And then second, they asked all the village community to come to a point where they make a public declaration. And that is the interesting aspect of it. So you have at the point a general meeting with, let's say, 100 villages being represented, in which they solemnly declare we are officially abandoning, we are officially abandoning the practice of female genital mutilation. Okay, so they have enlisted more than 100 villages, which did go through this uh, uh, public declaration system. So what is the result? What did she find? Uh, essentially, that the inter intervention of the NGO, in this case, Tosa, had no impact on the practice, uh, or hardly anyone. The second one, is that the uh, intervention has even generated perverse effect uh, in the form of a decrease in the age of cutting for the girls. In fact, the idea is to make it more secret. And we all know that the health risk increases if the age at which the girls are cut uh, is lower. Third result is that there is no evidence at all that public declaration had any impact and worked as a coordination and commitment device. Okay, so that, that, those are the results. Um, there are some others, but they all go into this uh, direction uh, that take us to question uh, this, this game. But of course, and this is one of the main points we argue in the paper, is we say, look, uh, uh, probably you shouldn't throw away the coordination game so easily because there is a very, very simplistic assumption behind this game, is that you have homogeneous preference. So what you want to understand is what happens if you have a, a heterogeneous preferences. And in fact, this is something that is easy to do. You know, the social norm approach based on coordination of incentive is essentially saying that your utility depends on the number of other people, the proportion P of the other people in the community that follow the practice. And the more do it, the more you want to do like they do. But there is a cost. And here you find this V amplifying factor, which is a function of, I would call the environment E, capital E. Though that can be a law, that can be a media, that can be the Western donors that could pressure for you to abandon. Uh, and, the, you know, that create a uh, rising hostility towards the practice. Now, theta I becomes an idiosyncratic coefficient measuring the aversion vis-a-vis -vis the customary practice for individual I, okay? And it is distributed in 
you know, in many possible ways. And so we want to, just to ask the question, suppose that, no, the utility is defined in this way rather than the, uh, the way it was defined in the previous game, what can you say? And, you know, unfortunately, I have no time to go into the details and the possible equilibria, but you can see that from that graph, without me going into the detail, that in fact there are various kinds of solutions possible, equilibrium outcome, and it all depends on the way theta is distributed. For instance, we have a situation where many people have a low aversion or a strong aversion vis-à-vis -vis the customary practice. Then in this case, you have a unique Nash equilibrium denoted by point A, which is stable because you impose stability to restrict the, the number of multiple equilibria. So in this case, in fact, the practice cannot disappear. Right? There is an interior equilibrium that is quite likely. But if you have many people who have a moderate aversion, towards the practice, and a few people with strong or weak aversion, then you find that you have two possible equilibria, one in which uh, zero people follow the custom, or a large number of the people uh, follow the custom. And you can have even the two situations, either everybody follows the custom, this is this corner solution, or nobody follows it. And this is a, a situation that uh, you can get also, in which uh, the curve is so low that, in fact, you're sure that everybody will abandon the custom. We also examined the case of a horizontal uniform distribution, in which case this curve will be linear, and then you have also a unique equilibrium, uh, which can be either everybody follow the custom or not. So, in a sense, what we learned from here is that uh, you know, this framework is richer than it appears to be, even though we have to agree that there is not much evidence in the literature from, so far, for this kind of practices that people are so much influenced by the behavior of the others, which of course would mean that you need uh, alternative approaches if this is the case. Now, of course, uh, an obvious uh, uh, alternative to that uh, is uh, that you abandon this kind of game, coordination game, and you adopt, for instance, a rival claimant's game. In a rival claimant's game, it means that what someone gets, the other doesn't get, uh, and so uh, you have a game that can enable you to study the situation of bargaining between the spouses, for instance. Uh, no, of course, if that is the case, it's rather easy to show that the former law can act by uh, powerfully or, or possibly by changing the threat point of the victimized uh, part of the couple, in this case the woman, and could have uh, an effect uh, on, uh, on the practice. Uh, we have in fact proposed in another paper of mine with Zaki Wahaj uh, and Aldachev uh, uh, a more sophisticated scheme in which a customary authority exists, which is deciding about the custom. So instead of saying the custom is there, it is fixed, we say no, no, it is chosen by the customary authority in repeated judgments that it is making when the case is submitted to him. Okay? Uh, and wha what we find is in fact that enacting a law that is favorable to women may have no impact, may have an impact, uh, or may have a perverse effect. By perverse effect, I mean that it could worsen the situation of the women. Okay? Uh, there are various arguments for that. I, I just uh, uh, tell you what I find is the, the more convincing argument, is that the judge has their own utility preference and a trade-off between following the law, which is their duty, or following their own intrinsic preferences for the customary practice. And the more the law departs from the customary practice, the more you're going to lose a number of formal judges who are going to follow their own preference for the custom than following strictly the law when they have a judgment submitted to them, even in the formal court. Okay, and so, so we have this result uh, that I think is interesting. Note, by the way, 
that it is converging with the result obtained in a paper recently published by Asemoglu and Jackson, but which have a completely different setup for norm, because for them, the law is reflecting the prevailing norms. Whereas we assume that the state could come with a law that embodies a practice that is at variance with the prevailing norm. But what is interesting is uh, Asem Asemoglu and Jackson is that they find the same result as we do, that too radical a law because it would reduce whistleblowing, would in fact uh, go against the interest of the victimized party. So this whole issue of how radical should be a law, I think, is an uh, extremely important one. No, there are many, uh, uh, there are quite a number of uh, uh, empirical literature findings about uh, this practice, uh, you know, this bargaining argument has strong support in the literature, but also we find uh, papers that show the perverse effect of the law, like the famous paper by Genico and uh, Shivan Anderson, uh, who showed that in India, a uh, more pro-women uh, succession law has had the effect of increasing the suicide rates of both the men and the women, which they explained by the fact that when you enhance the women women's bargaining power. You create more conflict within the household. And this is, of course, bad because it creates a lot of quarrels, etc., etc. Okay, now, uh, let me go um, rather quickly, and uh, I won't talk, I have no time to talk about changing preference, but I want uh, to say a word about uh, the macro environment. Here, the, the idea, if we come back to my previous, uh, uh, my previous slide, I can go very quickly on that. Uh, Yes, the, the idea is to increase E. Uh, and the idea is how can the macro environment increase the cost of following the norm? And does it have an, uh, an effect? And in fact, uh, I, I can go uh, rather straightforwardly towards the literature here because the argument is rather clear. Here we have beautiful paper. For instance, we have a series of beautiful paper on the practice of food binding for women in China. And th this practice has persisted for a dozen years since the Sang dynasty came at a peak during the Ming dynasty, 15th to 17th century, collapsed in the 1911 and 12th revolution. No, there is a debate about what caused that sudden abandonment uh, of the food binding practice. Uh, the, uh, the most well-known guy called Mackie, a sociologist, they say it's a campaigning, you know, women campaigning. But uh, there is another explanation that I find extremely well argued by economics who have shown that, in fact, it is a change in the macro environment in the following sense. That before what was dominated in China was home-based textile artisanal production and which demand that the women be sedentary and so have a restricted uh, mobility and uh, uh, that when the industrial textile production came to the countryside in China, mobility of the women became very important. Or if you want to say the thing otherwise, the cost of following the customary practice of restricting mobility of the women became higher. And so you see that in the area where the industrial textile production was appearing, suddenly the practice has collapsed in, in a few years. So that's a beautiful illustration. There are other studies, uh, uh, I won't mention, uh, done on Africa, etc., which show that there, when there is a rainfall shock or livestock collapse, etc., the age of marriage is changing. But one of the most important papers is concerning Western Europe by Voy, Glender, and Vogt, published in, uh, you know, in 2013 in American Economic Review. And they tried to explain late marriage in Europe. Why did it come at the time when it came, which means essentially 15th, 16th century? And essentially their argument is a black play, uh, black played argument. They say this was the time where there was the black plague, so there was a lot of these people, because there was a lot of vacant agricultural land. Uh, what you saw is the development of animal husbandry. And who were involved in this occupation? Women. And so women suddenly, there was a high demand for women to take care of the animals following the Black Plague. But there is something that they show in the contracts uh, in this period, is that as soon as you are married, as a woman, or pregnant, the, uh, the, the contract will be terminated. So an absolute condition for being involved in a, in fact, yearly renewable contract with an employer 
what to remain single. And so they explain this way uh, the late marriage. Now, what I want to add here is that, you know what is very interesting is that, uh, and I think it's not yet in the literature very much, is that what you have is interlinked norms. Like you have interlinked games, but here interlinked games depicting norms in, in the following sense. That norms can be in relationship of complementarity or at least uh, be compatible with each other. Uh, and uh, it can be that a change in the macro environment change the cost benefit, the cost efficiency of one norm, but not the other. And so a beautiful example is just that one, especially in Northwestern Europe. Uh, and I have a paper with Catherine Girkinger that is elaborating on that. That shows what? That shows that in fact in Northwestern Europe, it has been the case that when employment opportunities came for women, in fact, the status of women changed and their mobility became much more liberalized. But in other parts of Europe, Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, no change happened. Why? Because the mobility restricting norms and practices vis-a-vis -vis women didn't change and remain sticky. And so women could not go and seize up uh, the new employment opportunity and the norm didn't change. So it's interesting to know why in some part of Europe it changed or, or didn't change. And this is something that we discuss uh, in my paper with Catherine. No, the last point, and I conclude on that, since I have zero minutes, so I have to go in uh, less, than a, uh, less than a minute, uh, is the role of culture. Is that something that uh, is uh, usually overlooked? Is that social norms are part of a local culture that gives a symbolic meaning to the norm itself? And because of that, and because this culture are not centered on individuals, but on group, they are group-centered uh, culture, it means that when you touch a norm, you are touching on the identity of the people because you are touching on their culture. And this is something that Tostan have experienced. They had completely underestimated in the beginning, is that much resistance of the people. In fact, there are even areas where I couldn't enter villages because there was so much opposition to Tostan, where the real issue is the following. They say, you're aggressing us. You want to destroy our culture. You want to criminalize a practice, female genital mutilation, that is part of our tradition, which is part of the initiation process whereby women become adult women. And so it is Western imperialism. So, in a sense, once you are making, and what, what I want, and maybe one conclusion here, is that when you have this kind of attack on the norm, this is something that is hardly understood in the West when we talk about human rights approach and the necessity to defend human rights, is how it is perceived by the local people. And so, anything that resembles a direct confrontation with their culture is bound to have backlash and perverse effects. And in that sense, I think that it is much better for a government to have to kind of pro-women employment policy. I don't say they will automatically succeed, I've just said it. But that has the advantage that you avoid the head-on confrontation with the customary authority and with the people. But having said so, I must end up with a warning remark, and that's my own experience in Medina Gunas in southern Senegal, is that you never know in the defense of customary culture by local people who feel being aggressed by Western powers, how far they are being feeling or believing that, or whether they are being instrumentalized by customary authorities which have an interest in maintaining the customary practice and which use the cultural argument to mobilize the people around the reaction against what is perceived as a Western uh, intervention. Thank you.